Thank you. Um, bueno, muchas gracias por venir eh, a este diálogo algo improvisado eh, o algo improvisado. ¿Tú te hablas catalán? Eh, ¿Tenes catalán? No. Ah, ¿No? ¿Pues en castellano? O... Should I speak in English? The, the dialogue will be in English, don't the worry. The dialogue will be in English. Okay, then I... I'll, I'll turn it to English, uh, doesn't matter. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, I would like to thank you, first of all, uh, David too, for coming to Barcelona. He accepted the invitation to take part in a discussion this afternoon in, with Carlos Casas, who will come back uh, soon, I hope. <laughs> this afternoon at the CCCV, you are invited to come as well. Uh, there will be a nice discussion on sound, music, and art, and bioacoustics with some other uh, biologists, also specialists in this field. So, and we will talk about the installation that is, go is now um, in the Biennale d'Arte in Venezia, uh, whose artist is Carlos Casas, and it's on sound, and it's really a, a, a really nice soundscape to to listen to, hopefully we'll have the chance to experience it here in perhaps one year uh, in Barcelona, but we'll see if it work, if it will work. And we need also to thank you, Sergi Jourda, for hosting us here, this, as I said, improvised conversation. We just arranged it some days ago, and I know we, it's not easy to, to get into the schedule, so our busy schedule, so I'm really, really thank you as well for, for this opportunity to bring David to, to the university and have a discussion also with you. Um, so we will have a dialogue, they will have a dialogue <laughs> uh, yeah, on different topics um, that Sergi will uh, introduce you. And then we will open also the floor for, for your participation. We will be also glad to listen to your opinions or questions and have a nice discussion with you as well. So uh, thank you very much and, Th and please. Thank, thank yeah. you, Paul. Thank you. I'm Sergi Jorda. I'm a professor here at the university. I'm researcher at the Music Technology Group. And I always start the presentation saying it's an honor and a pleasure to present. And don't, don't get me wrong, I, it is always true, but today is especially true. Uh, first, because we, don't, we have great researchers uh, often presenting their work or their research, but not that often we have great musicians, and especially what I think it's great music thinkers as David. And also, I, it's more true today for me because I have been a big fan of the big tube since the early 80s when I remember in Barcelona in a pre period where there was no internet, there was no import, uh, finding an obscure uh, one record of you in a secondhand store uh, published by Brian Eno, obscure label, yeah. found and reinvented instruments. I don't think, how was it called? New rediscovered musical instruments. Okay. So that was really when I first discovered David. Then I remember in 94, in a trip to London, I bought your Buried Dreams CD, ah. which was also, for me, it was, was quite revealing. It was the first electronic recording that was combining, well, plenty of things. For me, it was quite a revelation. So after that, the internet came and it became much easier to follow you and to listen to your music and to read your books. But I just to tell you that I started in a period where you know, we know things were kind of more, more complicated. Yes, of course. So I, I, the truth is that Mr. Tube has done plenty of things. You were, <laughs> I have a, short, a, a, a very diverse career. Uh, he was a blues guitarist in the 60s, I guess, during your teenage. Yeah. A free improviser in the 70s, a music journalist and writer since the mid 70s. Uh, he was kind of reinventor, that's maybe my word, of ambient music since the 90s. 
and combining electronic sound with field recordings. He has collaborated with dozens of improvisers like Derek Bailey, John Zorn, uh, Evan Parker, and more recently you even played with Ryuichi Sakamoto before he passed. He has authored more than 10 books. I don't know exactly how many. No, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> and produced more than 20 albums, or, or maybe 30. <laughs> yeah. And he, he has been curator of art sound installations and also uh, sound exhibitions and designer of sound installations. So with all that, maybe I, I would propose that you start. How, would you, how do you define yourself? When, and, and could you briefly summarize your, your evolution? Why have you done the things you have done? And, and what are, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah. why? Well, I'm, I'm reading Marcel Proust at the moment. I've been reading, for a couple of years, I've been reading the whole from the beginning of Proust, something I tried to do many times uh, and failed. But now, suddenly, post-pandemic, I can do it. So I'm reading, I think I'm on the fifth volume now. And he says a very interesting thing, that um, there are many people within us you know, we're not a single identity. There are, we have many identities. But not all of those identities have the same um, moral standards. So there's this interesting idea that we have many personal identities and they can be in conflict in terms of the way they engage with the world. And um, I think one of the things I've been doing, not deliberately but accidentally, is exploring the different possibilities that we can become. Um, so instead of limiting myself to one thing, um, I decided to try many things early on. Um, as a teenager, I, I thought I would be an artist. And in fact, I studied at art schools. Um, but I was also, as you say, I was playing guitar in bands, and um, I was writing, too, um, in a very naive way, but beginning the kind of research that um, has become the basis for my books, and learning how to write. And I, I think that raises a very interesting problem. Um, how do you articulate what it is that you're doing? And the traditional, the traditional way for musicians is, is to say, I don't think about what I'm doing. I don't talk about what I'm doing. But in, in fact, that's, that's not true, because many m musicians, actually, when you see interviews with them, they're very articulate in, in talking about what they're doing. So, for me, that was a challenge. Um, how to be analytical, but at the same time maintain the kind of intuitive relationship to working with sound, working with listening, making music that you need. Um, and I think because of that um, rather complex mixture, also the you know, the work on becoming a visual artist. So you're, you're thinking about listening, but you're thinking about seeing as well, and then you're realizing that the senses are interconnected, that they're not separate. And so how does one perceptual faculty influence the other? All of these... Um, ideas have led to me developing this practice, which is, I would say, very open um, and very diverse. And I think it's a good place to be. You know, when students would always ask, you know, how can I, how can I do what I want to do? And it's a very difficult question. It's a very difficult question now. 
I see many young artists and old artists struggling now to survive. And I've always felt that, you know, you should, you should be able to do many things. So if one thing isn't working in, you know, as part of your practice or if it's not working economically for you, then you have something else. But they should work together as a practice. You know, so it's a kind of reflexive learning process so that you're always learning. It doesn't matter how old you are, you're always learning. And if you're learning, then you grow. And if you're not learning, then you shrink. Um, so that, I think, is very important. That's a very generalized answer to your question. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it, well, the, we will, the generalization we will is, deepen yeah, is, I'll, is I'll, important. While we discuss. So I will start with the question to, to the analyst and the, the writer. Uh, in in your, first, your first book, I think it was in 84, Rap Attack, yes. was one of the earliest attempts at studying and uh, analyzing something that was very of, of the present. Yeah. It was about hip hop, one of the first analy analy analyses of second. hip hop. Uh, it was the second. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, but the, the thing is, in 84, you talk about hip hop and rap. In 95, you talk about, you've you make a book about ambient. In 2004, you make a book about how technology is involving in, in the current music making. But then if we jump to the latest publications, in 17, you, you, Into the Maelstrom is about music and improvisation before the 70s. In 2019, Flutter Echo is about your memoirs. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to publish one about the first Dr. John album in 68. Is it retrospect and introspect the, the fault of Proust? Or maybe you don't think <laughs> that there's enough excitement in the present? No, it's not that at all. I think there's a lot of excitement in the present. Um, and one thing about this new book, I was conscious that it could be understood as something nostalgic. You know, somebody of a certain age. I'm 75 now, so somebody looking back to their teenage years, but it's actually not that at all. Although, I think nostalgia is very interesting. I mean, maybe we can come back to nostalgia because I think it's a very important way in which many people relate to music or or understand music. But this new book, I, I felt I, I wanted to understand a particular record. I wanted to, if you imagine putting one piece of music under a microscope and analyzing it from every different point of view, doing many tests on it, you know, to use a scientific analogy, doing many, many different kinds of tests on it, just to understand what is happening. And this particular record I chose because it had always been a mystery to me, and I wanted to understand it better. But I felt what it really did was to illustrate issues about race and the way race has impacted on um, the reception of music and the understanding of music, the analysis of music, um, and so on. So um, that, it seemed to me, was a really important subject for right now. And I, I wrote the book during the pandemic, and I was thinking of music at that time as a, as a kind of virus. Um, like a zoonotic virus, you know, a zoonotic virus is, is one where um, a disease can jump from one species to another, and that was always the theory about the pandemic, that it, it had gone from maybe monkeys to street markets to people. Um, so so music as a virus? Music as a virus, yes. And um, <clears throat> one of the references I used in the book 
is a novel by Ishmael Reed called Mumbo Jumbo, and he talks about music as a virus. He talks about music um, moving to the United States from Africa, so African diaspora uh, music and healing practices and um, cultural forms moving to the United States, particularly to Louisiana, where gradually they transformed into something called jazz, and then they spread right throughout the world. And in not so many years, you could find this form in London, in Shanghai, you know, wherever in the world. And so he talks about it as a virus, and I thought this was a very interesting uh, metaphor for the way music transmits, and it's something that's very important to us now. Um, migration is a huge um, aspect in our thinking for all kinds of reasons, um, political reasons, and uh, you know how to deal with this issue. And um, obviously, writing this book during the pandemic, it was such a strange time, you know, and it came about through this this virus, which was barely understood and nobody knew how to deal with it, but it created a whole new set of social conditions and political questions and um, physical constraints and so on, but actually was perfect for writing a book. <laughs> um, <coughs> and so um, there was also the uh, the Me Too movement, which was happening at the same time, you know, and these protests that erupted um, around the world, particularly in America, and many questions were raised about colonialism but, uh, during this period uh, that had been dormant for so long and needed to be asked. But, you know, for example, just uh, the fact that men who had profited from slavery were often immortalized in statues. This was one thing that came out. And so the question of why are we living with these statues? Um, why are we celebrating these men who profited from slavery? All of these questions were, you know, kind of going around and around my head. And it, it seemed to me that I could articulate them through the study of this record. One of the secrets of, to me of writing a book, you know, writing a book that's meaningful, is to find a, 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 a theme, a subject that is kind of sticky, you know, that, that has many things attached to it and, and it, it enables us to think about the present through that theme. So, yes, it was something that related to my teenage years, that had had an impact on my teenage years, but the mystery of it, you know, not understanding what was going on and being able to act almost as a kind of Sherlock Holmes, you know, a detective. What is happening here? Why is, you know, the question for me was, I mean, I'm not assuming that any of you know this record, but it's interesting because it was it was really about African diaspora, spiritual practices and music, um, inspired by a so-called Senegalese voodoo healer from the 19th century, represented by a white man from New Orleans who was working with mostly black musicians, with a black producer. So it's this very complex situation of, of um, masking, I would say, and identity, and um, yeah, all of these complex issues. So no, it wasn't me nostalgic for my teenage and years. So, and you're not deceived with the present. So I, I <laughs> will insist on that because I, I am and I don't know if it's me getting old and grumpy 
I'm discussing with my son about how music is kind of stopped. Stopped? Uh, tell me, I mean, to me, uh, well, I think we, we would both agree that music has had uh, one of the most avid art forms uh, for technology. Yes. And that music has been avid for technology for centuries and millennia. Yeah. Yeah. And that technology has shaped music very, in, a very, in very important matters. To me, and that's like shooting at my feet because I work with music technology for, for 40 years. In the 90s, we saw uh, a huge, I mean, te the technology changed everything. Uh, digital recording, hard disk editing, real-time synthesis, and that uh, had a, a huge impact in many music genres and, and many music that we hadn't heard during the 90s. It, uh, drum and bass appeared because of technology, IDM, electronica, glitch. To, in my perspective, or my, from my point of view, the, the 21st century has been a consolidation and standardization of all these tools and I don't see kind of new things, uh, or I, I don't get often very excited. And that's why I want to know or convince me that it's just my problem, that I should be more, open my ears more. That's a big responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. There is a lot of con consolidation in technology at the moment with the sense that we're perhaps on the edge of a new era, yeah, of course. which is a kind of scary era maybe, maybe in some ways. Maybe we can leave that for the next question. We'll leave that later, <laughs> yeah. But for me as a, you know, if I think back to when I was, say, 20 years old, and I had a vision of what I wanted to do, which was to bring together many different forms of different levels of technology, say, um, different ways of making music. And I couldn't do it. I mean, maybe if I had had a lot of money, I could have gone into a multi-track recording studio, but I didn't have the resources to do that. And I had to find a way um, to get somewhere closer to, to what I wanted to do. And um, so, you know, I was trying to find solutions using cassettes and, you know, I mean, very, very yeah. lo-fi solutions based on my economic circumstances at that time, which were terrible. Um, and by the late 80s, I was working with computer, making music. Um, and then by, I suppose, around 2000, I was working at home with computer and using a mix of audio and sequencing, and, and I was finally able to do what I dreamed about doing in 1970. So that was an incredible moment for me, and it meant I was making a certain kind of music you know, which was very layered, very detailed, and I mean, you know all of the possibilities of that time. And in a way, what you can do has not moved a, a very big distance from that moment. I mean, it's more sophisticated, it's more mm. complex, it's higher quality, and so on and so on, but, you know... I more tracks. Know, more tracks, and... Yeah, which more is always effects. dangerous, and more effects, which is always dangerous. But yes, I can produce more, uh, sometimes more creative records, sometimes more polished records. But one of the interesting things for me is, as an improviser, I've gone through many different phases. So, you know, in the 1970s, working with electric guitar, with effects, pedals, and working with flutes and so on. And then at a certain point, you know, moving towards things like laptop, using a laptop in improvisation. And now I've reached a point where 
I try to work completely acoustically. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's a strange trajectory. <laughs> and I'm interested in, I mean, maybe I'll talk about this in a moment, not now, but um, one of the things I find in improvisation is that I can incorporate these very basic technologies. I mean, the most basic. And I can combine them with, say, phone apps. And with, with phone, phone apps, like iPhone okay, yeah, apps, yeah. Um, that allow me to improvise very easily with sound, you know, digital sound, um, and go from one app to the other. And so I'm mixing that with, say, very simple bamboo flutes, or um, working with paper or cardboard, like I work with cardboard boxes, or leaves. If I, can find, if I can find an instrument in my garden, for me that's perfect. So, say for example, empty snail shells, or certain kind of plants that I can use. Um, and there's something to me quite beautiful about being able to go into my garden and find a plant, for example, that I can then use in an improvisation. But I can also incorporate my phone, you know, which is also very much part of my life. My garden is very much part of my life. It's part of my, I would say, my emotional life, my creative life. Um, it's the way I'm engaging with the kind of nature that is possible, you know, living in London, and actually that's quite a lot. Uh, I let my garden grow quite wild. I have a pond there, so I have frogs and so on in the garden. Um, and this plant material, you know, which I can collect, there's one particular plant I like, which is called Equisetum hiumari. It's, it's also called scouring rush or horsetail. And it, it, you see it a lot in Japanese gardens. Um, it grows very tall, thin, it's like bamboo, but it has a very abrasive surface to it. And it, in fact, it's used by, uh, I think it, it was, I don't know if it's still used, but it has been used by oboe players because it's like a fine sandpaper, this plant, so they can use it to, uh, to repair their reeds. Um, so this plant, when it dries, because of its um, abrasive surface, it is very good for making certain percussive sounds. So, you know, this this is very much integrated in my life, and that's something very important to me. You know, it's not that it's something... I mean, I watch a lot of YouTube tutorial videos, you know, Ableton Live and this kind of thing, out of curiosity, how are people making music, how are certain producers working. I'm interested, you know, I'm curious, both, uh, both as a thinker about music and somebody who makes this kind of music myself, using programs like Logic and Live and so on. And the videos are always the same, you know, it's, it's like that, this that's why I completely, was... um, you know, like an office type setting uh, with nothing in it at all except a screen and a keyboard and, you know, a uh, computer. And, um, I mean, very often I like the music, you know. I'm interested in new production techniques and so on. And I'm interested in new hip-hop and new R&B and all of this kind of thing. But this setting, you know, it seems to me it's, it's like you're making music in a hotel somehow. And I mean everything about it, you know, the screen and so on. So, um, I'm... Because I'm older and I have more diverse experience, I think the importance of me, for me, 
using technologies that connect to me in some way as part of my growth, I would say, psychological growth, my emotional life and so on, my physical life is very important. So for me it's natural to, to combine plants with iPhone. It's because iPhone, you know, it's so much part of your life and you do so many things on it. I was talking to somebody the other day, last week, a German guy wanted to interview me about Aphex Twin because I'd interviewed Aphex Twin twice very early in his career, once when he was still at college, actually, and then just after. And he was doing a program which celebrated this record Aphex Twin released, um, this kind of ambient record. And he said to me, I mean, he was a young, young guy, and he said, what was it like then in the 90s when this record was made? And I said, well, you know, there were certain things. There was a, it was a time of big technological change. There was a lot of optimism. Technology, technology was sort of optimistically at that time, right? It was like, it was all about the future and growth and being able to do exciting things with technology. And there were many new inventions at that time which made certain things possible. But I said to him, you know, what we're doing now, which, is, which was talking on Zoom, him in Germany and me in the UK, would have seemed like science fiction then. It was, it was just like, okay, for many, many years, people have written or portrayed in science fiction this idea that you could speak to somebody and see their face as well in real time. But it was just a dream in the mid-90s. And now it's just ordinary. I mean, it's just, in fact, it's more than ordinary. It's like you were saying that things had changed since the pandemic. You know, now it's completely, okay, we'll just have a Zoom meeting or we'll do FaceTime or whatever. You know, it's just so integrated into our lives that we've forgotten that it's kind of a miracle. So that for me is one of these stories of technology, that a miracle becomes commonplace, and then the next miracle becomes commonplace, and then the next miracle becomes commonplace. And I think for me to be able to work with plants and iPhone apps at the same time is like, um, I'm trying to absorb that miracle into myself somehow, rather than it just existing on the surface of me as a complex person, you know, as, as, as of me as this Proustian, many charactered, many morality object. Yeah, I don't know if we jump to the next miracle. I, I don't have time, or <laughs> sorry, or, or maybe we can. Ask, long. Or we can. No, we can, before jumping to the next miracle, we can ask something different. Uh, <clears throat> you have mentioned about the plants and, and the, all the details that are always present in, in your music. Uh, on the other side, it's often labeled as ambient, what some people think is just kind of ba background of music d'ameublement. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, I mean, do you think that people are not in particular concerning your music, but to the, li the listening habits and the way we consume or are surrounded by music, it makes, it gets every time more difficult to, to, to uh, or maybe less people are prone to, to getting all these details. Don't you think we are starting a more and more superfluous relation with sound? I don't know, Carlos and I were talking about this a bit last night. I mean, one of the things that I would say has changed for me is that um, when I was a teenager, I was thinking about music and everything that is wrapped up in music, you know, your personal development, your romantic life, your... Um, your sense of belonging to a community, your understanding of something that is outside of yourself, 
all of these complex issues that are connect up through music and then my attention maybe shifted more towards sound and thinking about how sounds are constituted and how sounds work and thinking about how we produce sounds, how we find sounds and then moving more towards listening which is another completely different emphasis and from the perspective of the listener what is happening what's going on with music, what's going on with sound, how does... why is sound important in our lives, you know, why is music a human constant? I don't know of any society on record that hasn't had music or doesn't have music, so that makes music one of the most important things in human life, it's also, I mean, this is something we'll be talking about later, but also extra human life or non-human life. Um, objects have sounds um, and part of the life of objects is determined by their sounds. So, you know, that passage, I would say, that trajectory, that movement through from music to sound to listening has been very important to me. So, uh, you know, because of the age I am, I've seen things change dramatically when I wrote Ocean of Sound in 1995, there were very few books about sound and listening. And um, maybe a certain evolution of listening through the 20th century to the 21st century. Now, of course, there are thousands of books. I mean, literally thousands. But people listen less. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm coming to. So. I think, I think there are some people who listen more, actually, and who've been guided by, you might say, prophets like, for example, Pauline Oliveros, who talked about deep listening. This, this, um, this idea she came up with of deep listening was very important because it made a distinction between survival listening which all of us who have hearing faculties do, you know, how we, how we listen out for the car that's coming towards us or how we converse with each other and so on. And deep listening, which is a much more intensive relationship to sound. Um, so there are many more people involved in uh, the study of sound, the study of listening, uh, the kind of work that you're doing here, um, all of these things have grown. Um, the growth of sound art, the growth of field recording, the growth of um, similar courses to this one in universities, teaching establishments around the world, all that has grown. I've seen that grown in a very dramatic way. On the other side, I'm not so sure. Um, people listen in a different way. And obviously, we're affected by technological changes and the way that changes our sense of time in particular. And, you know, what is possible now is extraordinary compared to. 1995, just to choose that date, you know, when I wrote Ocean of Sound. Yeah. When I wrote Ocean of Sound, I was trying to connect up many different forms of sound making and listening practice <coughs> and music practice. And I thought that was missing. You know, there are many great music books, but they tend to, they've, in the past, have tended to specialize in one form of music or another or they're very general histories of music. And in that sense, they're very frustrating because they always begin with so-called primitive music, you know. <laughs> and then they sort of jump to the Greeks and the Egyptians and then suddenly we're in Europe, miraculously. And, you know, this is not how I understood music at all. Um, so I, I wanted to write a book in which say, recording seals under Antarctic ice 
was as important as new developments in electronic dance music, which was as important as, um, I don't know, a, a jazz innovator like Sun Ra, which was as important as um, music from Papua New Guinea or uh, music from Bali and, and so on. So it was, it was a question of bringing all of these things to the same level, to get rid of this hierarchy, to get rid of this idea of um, evolutionism, I suppose. You know, this idea that there is primitive music and somehow it evolved to become bules in some way. For me, there's a simultaneity, and that's something to do with growing up with a record collection, I suppose, and experiencing all of these things at the same time. But how to write about that, that was the challenge. Yeah, yeah I have so many questions and so few minutes. Uh, maybe I, I, we could talk about, I had questions like, how, how can musicians survive nowadays? How can musicians uh, survive? Uh, but I will ask a, a more, a less obvious question, uh, which is about music and dreams. Mm. Uh, because we are in a network now working with music and sleep, uh, looking at the effects of music in sleep and during sleep and the effect of sleep while listening to music. Mm. Mm. And I, I'm asking you that because your music is really like, like for me, most of your music is like the music that would happen in a dream. Ah, interesting. Uh, sometimes even in nightmares, it's kind yeah. of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about your relation with, I mean, do you, do you have music in your sleep? Do you sleep with music, uh, mm. about music? Yeah. Or, or what do you think about this relation with your music and, and aesthetically with sleep? Yeah. With in dreams. The, in the 1970s, I wanted to do a book about music and dreams. I had a, an idea and I, I, um, I was working on a music magazine then called Musics, which was a collectively produced magazine about experimental music and improvised music. And I, I just wrote a thing saying if anybody has any dreams they would like to send me about music in which they hear music and dreams, please send it. And I got one response. <laughs> and so that idea was not working. And, and what had happened, I was starting to have dreams in which I experienced a kind of, I experienced hybrid instruments. Um, and these were, it was very clearly to me based on music I was listening to at the time. Um, so, for example, I was listening to a lot of bioacoustic sound, and I was researching bioacoustic sound. So I was, I was very interested in, for example, dolphin sound, um, the use of echolocation. And I was interested in ultrasonics, but I was also interested in uh, the underwater sounds of seals because they sounded to me like um, electronic music of a certain kind. But then I was making instruments. I was making these invented instruments. And in dreams, I was hearing a composite of these two different things. So I was hearing instruments that produce sounds a little bit like um, marine mammals. And I thought, you know, what if we could actually make these instruments? So that's interesting. You know, we can learn something from our dreams about how to develop new technologies. I actually had a dream um, two nights ago in which there was music. Um, and I'd been thinking about the conversation with Carlos and Paul, which is happening later. And I was listening to various things. I was listening to recordings I'd made myself of Yanomami shamanism in 1978. 
And then I started listening to this uh, recording of, uh, I think it was made in um, maybe Vietnam, Hill Tribe people playing these very big uh, mouth organs They're made from bamboo and they're, they're huge. So they, they produce this very strange, deep sound. And I, I was just listening to it. And then I had a dream where I went back to university because I retired from being a professor like two, three years ago. And I went back and there was a kind of setting just like this, actually, with some colleagues of mine. And there was a friend of mine playing music in a group. And um, it was kind of like string band music, but it also had this Southeast Asian hill tribe music feel to it. And my friend, Peter Cusack, who's a guitarist I work with, fantastic um, field recordist, um, he was singing, but he had all his fingers in his mouth, you know, right in his mouth. <laughs> And it was making this strange kind of humming sound, a bit like one of these hill tribe mouth organs, but also like a kind of bee or something. So the music was very weird. I mean, it was like <laughs> quite conventional acoustic guitar music with this <laughs> sound. <laughs> and again, it's the same, you see, it's the same phenomenon that two <coughs> elements are becoming hybridized into something else. So they're becoming almost beyond human. They're becoming that part of consciousness of ourselves which we really don't understand so much. You know, it's, it's non-waking consciousness. And I think um, dreams have a lot to tell us in that sense of what is possible. So that connection f that you um, take from my music that it's like it's dreamlike is yes I would say that's a, a motivating factor or a inspirational element of what I do I'm trying to make music that is closer to that non-waking consciousness or hypnagogic hypnagogic states where we we're, we're between waking and sleep and in that moment, we can have very strange visions, strange imagery, kind of things we would never think of normally, or we hear strange sounds. And it's, it's about the potential of the human being. I mean, it's the same as technology. Technology is about the potential of the human being, and maybe how it connects us with non-human, which is something we desperately need to do better at which is what we'll be talking about later. Thank you. Yeah, I think we could continue. I have plenty of questions, but maybe we open the floor to the audience that yeah, sure. probably has also questions. Yeah. We have a microphone here. And you should use the microphone because it's being streamed. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. Uh, uh. Hi. Um, Hi. Nice to meet you, first of all. You too. My name is Isabel. Um, throughout this conversation, something that has been apparent to me um, that has maybe guided your career, I don't know if you will agree with this, is this idea of your finger always being on the pulse. And this idea of you sort of having an intuitive sense of what is coming next. Um, I mean, you talked about this uh, right at the end of the conversation, this idea of the potential of the human being and how technology is kind of guiding that. And I was wondering, um, if, if you put your finger on the pulse now, where do you see this human potential coming next for, for like a young person like me, maybe technologically, creatively, musically, I guess, that way? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question because uh, having the finger on the pulse or being aware of what's happening now has always been very important to me. It informs what I do. It doesn't necessarily um, change what I do so much, but it's yeah, it's. I think it's important to understand what's happening now. 
but I never talk about the future. Mm -hmm. And I remember a time, this time in the 1990s, there was an obsession with the future. And if you were a writer, inevitably somebody would commission you to write about the future. And I remember I wrote one of these pieces, and it was against all my better instincts to do it, you know. I should have said no, because my feeling was that um, the future is very unpredictable because there are too many variables. You know, there are too many different elements, and I'm not just talking about the variables in, say, music technology, of which there are many, but, you know, global politics, its effect on economics, for example, will have a massive impact on what happens. Um, that can have a massive impact on learning establishments and um, how people are able to survive and how much they can exploit the potential of what's there at the, any given moment. All of these things can change and um, we never know. So, something happens, like a pandemic, or like a big terrorist attack, or a war somewhere, you know, and that changes everything. It changes whether, for example, it will change arts funding, you know, whether, whether people are going to invest in a certain kind of cultural activity. That can all change, dramatically. You know, because of what's happening with the money supply. And um, it's impossible for any one person to keep all of these variables in, in their mind, let alone, uh, you know, as a working, in their working life. So, you know, for that reason, I would never talk about the future. Because I realized retrospectively that I may have understood a movement as it was happening, or understood as much as I possibly can. You know, so when I wrote a book about hip-hop in 1984, a lot of people said to me, what a stupid thing to do, you know, to write a book about hip-hop, because next year it'll be finished. You know, and nobody will want to read a book about hip-hop. People actually said this to me. You know, it's like it's a, it's a passing phase. It's just a fad. It's just a fashion. And actually, the next year after I wrote the book, hip-hop just blew up completely to become, you know, a, a massive phenomenon. So, um, and I didn't foresee that, even though I was writing a book about it, you know. I thought, well, hip-hop, yeah, it's very, very interesting. It will, it will change and develop, but I didn't see it becoming something that will play in stadiums and become the most popular music in America. So, you know, even if you're very well informed, you can't understand the future. But I think to understand what's happening now and to work with it in your own way is very important. So maybe that seems like a contradiction, but I, I think, you know, it's always good to be skeptical about the future. Everybody's speculating about AI now, you know, and some people are pessimistic, some people are optimistic, some people think it's, yeah, it's great for what they do, some people think it's going to destroy what they do, but the truth is we don't know. And we don't even know six months ahead, you know, what might happen. In the same way that we don't know six months ahead what might happen in our, our lives, you know. Um, at the beginning of this year, I didn't know all of the things I would be doing or how my work would change. So, who knows? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's very interesting. I think uh, your answer to my question is, is, I think, something simple that we're all supposed to do, which is sort of be grounded in the present moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, I, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, coming back to something like gardening. Gardening will keep you in touch with the seasons and how things change and what lives and what dies. And, you know, the, the, this small ecology close to your 
I mean, not everybody have, can have gardens. Very few people can have gardens. So I consider myself lucky, but it connects you with the weather. And, you know, all of these questions are very important for us now because of climate emergency. So the more you have a personal understanding of how these things work, the more you have a, a more a global understanding, I would say, of what's happening with climate emergency and less inclined to say these ignorant things that people say, you know, that there's no such thing as global warming and, you know, if there's global warming, why is it so cold? And, you know, all of this uneducated stuff, you know. So if you put yourself in personal relationship to this phenomena, then you're closer to understanding it. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Hi. Jorge. Uh, thanks for the talk, uh, or the conversation, rather. Um, you spoke about deep listening, and um, I want to know your opinion or perspective on this idea, especially, I think, by older generations of musicians, that nowadays, partly due to um, the possible like stimulation, constant stimulation that we have, and also the, the ubiquitous access to music that we have, that we may have lost uh, the some uh, some ability to to listen and to listen deeply. Um, so I want to know what you think of that, what you see around you, and and maybe yourself as well. Yeah, th this is also something Carlos and I talked about last night. Uh, we had a quite a wide-ranging conversation, and I was telling him that I was contacted recently by a very interesting music writer and uh, radio broadcaster, Jennifer Lucy Allen. Um, she wrote a great book about fog horns. But now she's writing a book about why she doesn't listen to music so much anymore. And she wanted to have a conversation with me because I had written a piece years ago about why I stopped listening to music. Um, I went through a particular phase where suddenly I couldn't really listen to music anymore. It was like a crisis for me because, you know, that was how I earned my living, right? So it's, it's um, potentially a very dangerous thing. I wrote an article about it in The Wire magazine, and as I said to her, it was, of all the pieces, uh, thousands of pieces I've written, it was the most controversial. A lot of people were very upset by it, actually, as if I had personally attacked their own connection with listening to music, which I hadn't done at all. It, it was me writing about myself. And uh, some people were, were concerned, you know, they, they talked to me, you know, in this quiet, concerned voice as if I suddenly contracted a fatal illness, you know. Uh, uh, so the response was really dramatic to this piece, and I, I think a lot of people felt personally threatened by it. Um, which wasn't my attention at all. I was just writing about something that was happening to me. And I, I think it's true that the relationship to listening to, to music has changed because we are changing in ways that we can't understand because it's happening now. Um, and obviously the first thing we turn to is technology. How has technology changed us? But I'm not so sure. I, I, I think it's more complicated than that. And she was saying as well when she contacted me that she felt it was more complicated than that. And I know, speaking personally, if I'm listening in a functional way, say, say when I was writing my last book, I was listening to certain pieces of music <coughs> I would say forensically, so that I could hear things that were almost not there. So if I was listening to this record I was writing about, I was hearing um, things that were happening in tape editing that were unintentional. I was, I was, I was hearing... Um, 
uh, certain mistakes in the mixing, for example, that I'd never heard before. You know, so I could listen in this extremely uh, detailed way. But if I'm listening to a piece of music, you know, for pleasure, <laughs> I wish I hadn't said that now. If I was <laughs> listening to a piece of music um, because I listen to music, it's what I've done all my life. Um, I'm already impatient with it. You know, I want to move to the next thing. And that's relatively new, say in the last 15 years, maybe. So, I, I don't know, I'm not a pessimist in that way. I'm, I'm not one of these older people who says, oh, everything's terrible now, and, you know. Um, but I do recognize that listening has changed for many people. And for, for some people I know it's intensified. They're listening to music all the time. Um, because this ubiquity of music for them is, is a very positive thing. And it's something that they wanted all their life. And, you know, to just be almost drowning in music. But for other people it's more problematic, I think. And for me, I, th I think I don't listen to music nearly as much as I did. But then, on the other hand, I've listened to so much music. And somehow, William Burroughs said this thing about taking drugs. He said, you only need to take a drug once. I mean, th he didn't live by this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> His theory was you could you could take a drug once and you understand it you understood how it worked and you know you could recall that feeling. Well, I don't necessarily believe that, but I know what he mean he meant. And I feel a little bit you know with music, I can hear it and it's like yes, I okay I understand that. So it's not a complete answer to your question, but I think you know we're in the process of understanding something new. No, it, it definitely works. Um, also, the, I like that you shift the focus to us, not just technology. Like, we're not somehow dependent on technology entirely, and there's maybe some change going, us in, going on in us as well. I think so, yeah. <coughs> maybe there's time for a last question. Somebody. Have a short question? Yes. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try and give short answers. <laughs> That's hard. Hi, David. Uh, hi. hi. So I have a question about uh, ambient music from the 90s. So this is a topic which fascinates me, mm -hmm. um, especially because I really, really enjoy the soundscapes uh, which have been produced over the course of the 90s. And for me, they share some kind of characteristic which I cannot really put my finger on. I, I cannot really define what exactly is this kind of like entity which, which is present in ambient soundscapes from the 90s. Mm -hmm. So I would like to approach this as follows. Um, what would be a good way to maybe, yeah, not summarize, but characterize the state of mind which was present with ambient musicians from the 90s? So how would they go about to create an ambient piece which sounds amazing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what you have to do um, one of the things you have to do is <coughs> suddenly think about information and globalization as if they're completely new to you. They're not something that's embedded in your life, it's, it's a new thing. And you don't know where it's going and there are some people writing um, crazily optimistic ideas about where it's going and then there are other people who are writing crazily pessimistic ideas about where it's going. Then you think you have to think about club music at that time. Um, so late 80s, early 90s, Acid House was a big thing. And you know, these crazy records using a 303 um, and it was just music you'd never heard before. You know, it was um, music that was so intense and so unrelenting. Um, 
just a completely new thing. So you have to imagine that is new to you and not something that is just like, oh, that's a historical form of music that I understand completely. Um, and then I suppose the third thing, what was the third thing? There was a third thing I was thinking about. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> You just lived through the 1980s, which and a lot of the 1980s was about money and wealth and um, development. You know, if you think of the Japanese boom in property and the craziness that that engendered, and then suddenly you're in this era where everybody's a hippie again. <laughs> you know. And, Everybody's interested in essential oils and taking drugs and chilling out and doing yoga and all of this stuff and everybody's into relaxing and you know so this there's this word chill out. I mean chill out was an expression that was around you know hip hop uh, but it, it took on a different meaning and it took on this meaning that you just relax and you lay back and you absorb music or whatever it is, film, anything. So if you can do those three things, put yourself in that position for those three things, then you can make 90s ambient music. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay. You were raising your hand, so maybe yeah, the, the, well, the last... Uh, I don't know if I can this, you need uh, the microphone. microphone. Yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed to share an anecdote because I yes. think it comes to the... I teach uh, some workshops on, on, on sound and uh, lately I, I teach with kids in school. And as we are, you were talking about attention and the future and where the people is listening, I was really surprised to um, uh, uh, discover that the kids with the 12 years old that I was uh, doing the, the workshop, as soon as I saw the recorder, a recorder, a Zoom, a Tascam, a field recorder, they told me, oh, do you have a machine to make S ASMR? So mm -hmm. I didn't know that they were like, and I was like, what, what you know what is ASMR? And they, they, they show me in their, their phones, they, they listen in the night to a ASMR. Uh, like, um, sometimes like a, the sound of the waves or, yeah. or, uh, or somebody brushing the hair. And then we end up making a workshop of, uh, for them to, to, to do the ASMR. Yeah. But I was surprised that a kid with 12 years old, they, all, all of them, they, they knew this thing. They say they have channels yeah. in TikTok where they, listen and appreciate this thing, and, and I, yeah. it completely blew my mind, and uh, it's something that I discovered just uh, recently. Yeah, well my eight-year-old granddaughter has, um, she has this thing called a Yoto, which is a, a thing where you have kind of memory cards, and you know, everything is big, you know, so it works for an eight-year-old, and the memory cards can have things like stories, or they can have music, or they can have ambient sounds. So already at that age, they're getting access to this. And I actually wrote a, a, an academic essay about microsound and ASMR, which is, I think, about to be published very soon by Routledge. And um, it was about the, the difference and the similarities between ASMR and microsound. Microsound, as, as you know, somebody like me would use it, the different agendas of ASMR, but one of the things I learned is that there are some very young ASMR influencers, and it's quite controversial because ASMR, as you know, has this kind of slightly sleazy side, you know, with sexual connotations and so on. So there was one particular child who was quite a successful ASMR influencer. And so there's the question of, who is watching this stuff and what are they doing with it, you know, so these very big ethical issues around it. But certainly that generation is very, I think, is very interested, younger than 12, is very interested in ASMR because, partly because their parents grew up with, like, whale sounds and um, sounds of the sea, you know, like, it was very standard giving birth and listening to whale sounds and so on, or using these kind of sounds to get to sleep. So the parents give it to the children. And, and also, of course, as you say, it's, it's there on TikTok or YouTube or whatever. Um, so it's kind of surprising, but it's also not surprising. And the implications of what it means for 
maybe if they make music when they get older, a bit older, then that's interesting to speculate on that. Hmm? Thank you. What do you think, Paul? We need to conclude? Think, yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. For, oh, yeah. Thank you all. Video yeah. For this super interesting conversation, I really enjoyed it. And thank you also for your participation and questions. They were also very appealing. Um, there will be more this afternoon if you want to come over uh, the CCCV um, from 7 uh, in the evening. <coughs> Maybe it will be there as well. So um, we'll be talking some with other topics, but similar mm -hmm. and and I hope we don't uh, <laughs> <laughs> say the same things. The same things, yeah. <laughs> but there will be other things also with Carlos' presence there. Um, so thank you very much. It's been really a pleasure. Thank you, Sergi, for hosting this. Yes, event thank here. you for yeah. inviting me. Uh, and thank see you, you soon again. Yeah, please. <laughs>